All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined all the way from Toronto by Faisal Siddiqui. How are you doing, Faisal? Very good, John. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and Faisal is a, is a strategist making brand marketing more accountable and effective for all. You uh, run the creative business company, Strategy ROI winner and X profit. And you can, and what we're going to talk about today is why you can't scale profitably using performance marketing alone. So, um, Faisal, let's get straight into it. For, for a start, maybe define performance marketing just in case anybody doesn't understand the, the premise here. The way we like to think about performance marketing is that it works at the point of need, so at the point of purchase. So someone has displayed uh, a certain intent uh, to purchase, and performance marketing matches that intent with a bid-based ad system. So um, how do we contrast that to brand marketing? Well, the way we think about brand marketing is when someone has not displayed a need or is not potentially within the category. It's a different type of marketing. It's it's more of a soft sale. So the way we think about performance marketing, it's direct response, it's typical kind of direct marketing. Someone is potentially in the market today, and performance marketing is a very good way of capturing and converting uh, that existing demand. Right. But obviously, if you want to scale beyond that and you want to go out and kind of uncover and maybe pro you know, um, attract the right kind of buyers, you know, you obviously need to go beyond that, right? Well, I think I think so. You can. There's a lot of brands that have um, scaled exclusively uh, with performance marketing, but I think the challenge is that it gets really expensive, and it gets expensive mm -hmm. primarily just because, um, well, for three reasons. The first one is because someone has displayed uh, their intent publicly, so they have done something on online that suggests a predilection um, to be interested in your product. Um, because they've displayed that intent publicly, both you and all of your competitors are now bidding at the point of purchase. So yeah. that gets expensive because it's a, as you know, performance marketing is an auction-based mm -hmm. bidding system. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the ability to target down to a very narrow slice has gotten um, more expensive just yep. because of GDPR and other rules where it makes where it makes that type of targeting very hard. And then the third thing that makes it really expensive is that it's also you're also fishing within a very small pool. So there's a a, a really great stat coming out of the Ehrenberg Bass Institute of Marketing Science that some of your listeners may. Uh, be, may have heard of Byron Sharp, who's a famous marketing um, scientist. And uh, so he's the head of the Ehrenberg Bass Institute. And they have a really interesting study, which is called the 95-5 rule, which is um, over the course of a company's lifetime, 95% of their eventual buyers, most of those are not act actively shopping in the category right now. Mm -hmm. um, so what does that mean? That means that they don't really have a need now. They may have a need in the future but they're not actively shopping. So if they're not actively shopping, um, performance marketing can't, um, can't, can't serve them ads. And so really you're constant, if you put all of your budget within performance marketing, you're really concentrating all of your, five, your firepower to the 5% of active shoppers who are in the market right now. Mm -hmm. And what, what, are the, what are the other challenges, Faisal, is a big challenge today is that um, there are so many different ways you can market, so many different platforms, so many different places you can be, so many different strategies you can approach that. I think sometimes either people get stretched too thin because they feel like they need to be everywhere or they get paralyzed because they're not sure where they should be and there seems to be so many options. So how do you help people like really figure out where they should be putting their attention? I think it's two things for us with our clients. It's one, who your audiences are. So where do they hang out? So for example, if you're going after uh, boomers, then maybe... Um, using TikTok influencers is probably not the best place to be. Mm -hmm. um, so one, it's the, it's your audience. And then two, it's how much money you have. So um, we do know that your ROI does increase as you add more channels, but um, equally, you don't want to spread too thin. So it's a, it's a function of A, where, where does your audience hang out? And then B, um, how much money do you have? And how can you 
And I'd, I'd say a third thing, which is really like, what is the objective of the campaign? Are you trying to raise awareness or are you going to try, are you trying to raise, uh, drive a sale? And I think, say, for example, it's awareness, you probably go for a broader media coverage and more frequency, whereas if it's a sale, you may want to go uh, more of a big bang and it's more of a saturation play. So it really depends on those three things, audience, budget, and what is your campaign objectives. And I think, yeah, that, and I think that's another challenge, isn't it? Campaign objectives, because sometimes I, I think a lot of people try to do both, right? Or they try to do three things in a campaign as opposed to focus on one. And I think that's the other part too, is is the the kind of science part behind this and the testing and the making sure of all of it. I, I often feel that that's skipped over. And like I said, people end up with like three messages in, in one as opposed to being very, very uh, defined in their approach very deliberate if you like yeah i think it's a really good point i th- and i think i i empathize just because mm-hmm. i think for smaller brands it's kind of hard to um carve out marketing budget for one type of tactic versus another and you kind of have to do both mm-hmm. at the same time uh, but i think at, to your point as much as possible the more we can be messy or mutually exclusive in our objectives for our campaigns i think the better yeah. And and then I mean you you also mentioned the the expense part and I think that's the, that that's something that can shock people uh, how expensive this can become if you don't get it right. I mean even Google Ads on their own if you're in I mean say like you know we have a CRM right so CRM keywords massively expensive right. But I don't think people often realize quite how expensive they are and quite that their money doesn't go that far really unless they've got a lot of it. A hundred percent. And I think, I think, um, well, let's put it this way. We actually advertise ourselves as, as an agency and we put Mm -hmm. money behind LinkedIn. And then we also dip our toes in print advertising. And we had a nice little test. We got a good deal, um, on a full page print ad in a national business publication. It was called the report on business. And so we dipped our toes in that we did a full page ad. It got a bit of a blip of traffic to our website. And I'm being, you know, in full disclosure, but Mm -hmm. I think what we realized was that, you know, we paid six grand for it. It ran once for one month. And really, uh, unless we saturate the market, unless we, um, you know, follow that up with month on month advertising um, and, you know, uh, it would be helpful to also say that we weren't trying to drive an immediate sale. Sure. Um, It's not really, it it didn't really work out for us. So again, um, to, to, to really see the results, you do have to commit to it. And, and there's no such thing as a, as an easy, quick win. Yeah. And I think, yeah. And I think that is the hardest part because I mean, people, we love dipping our toes in the water or let's try out this. And then like a month or two later, oh, well, it's not really giving us the results. Let's scrap this and go on. But as we know, these things tend to take a lot of time. Um, so what are some of the, what do you think some of the strategies that are maybe overlooked by people and especially maybe for people who don't have huge budgets or need to be a little bit more, more discerning what are some of the tactics they could uh, adopt well we're a performance brand agency so i'll start mm-hmm. with brand and yeah. i and i will say I'll, I'll first start with i think the brand industry has done a terrible terrible job of actually articulating the business benefit of brand marketing um, and, 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 and really, um, we only have ourselves to blame. And what do I mean by that? So I think for the last decade or so, um, folks in brand, both client side and agency side have been completely framing the topic in the wrong way. So it's often talked about as, you know, we need to articulate higher order emotions, or it needs to be mm-hmm. about the purpose of the company. And frankly, this is all, that's all bullshit. <laughs> and, and you really can't secure a budget for, for brand building from executives using that type of mm-hmm. argument. I think the way we talk about brand marketing is I, I, I had mentioned before the 95, five rule, which is, mm-hmm. you know, only 5% of your, of your, of your, of your, um, of the market is actively shopping the category right now. So there's only, if you think about that 5%, we call that current demand. Whereas future demand are the people, are the 95% of potential shoppers who are not actively shopping the category. So the minute you frame it that way between current demand and future demand, what we'll say is, well, brand marketing is very good 
at capturing that or, or building future demand, excuse me. Mm -hmm. So it's for people who perhaps don't have an immediate need. So you, therefore, you're not going to use a hard sales message. You're going to use a soft sales message. A great example of that, you know, I'm sure you're aware of this, but is the great HSBC campaign. So, um, the, you know, their brand marketing was all about the work, world's local bank. They weren't trying to sell you a credit card right now. And what what is the point of brand marketing is well, when that 95% do enter the category, your brand is top of mind. So they don't go through a search and they and they go directly to HSBC. At the same time, HSBC does run, run performance or used to run performance campaigns right. with with hard sales message saying, you know, here's a credit card, here's the rate, and this is why you need to buy it now. So I think that's the first thing um, to answer your question. What can a small company do is, is I, I do very much believe that to get someone to buy, um, it's so much easier if they have heard of who you are yeah. And so that kind of pre-selling piece, which is the role of brand marketing, I think is very, very um, advantageous. And I think the, the sooner you start talking about brand marketing in terms of building that pre-awareness and not in terms of purpose and fluffy emotions, <laughs> I think you've made, your, <laughs> you've made yeah. it a lot easier. Yeah, and just I'm just on that point too about the 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 brand marketing, and I and I agree with you. I think you have to get it very very well defined because I feel like today, as as you just said, you know, people again, people are trying to throw a bunch of things in. You know, our brand stands for this. We also stands for that, and we're also involved over here, and uh, and it can get very confused. So I and and there's a tendency to fall into that like whatever the trend is of the thing is you know let's be mission driven and you know put all that stuff which is all fine if that's your so if that's your main focus but particularly like small and medium sized businesses got to keep the message very and the brand very contained i would say otherwise because you already have a problem you're already trying to be heard in a noisy market probably without the money so the last thing you need to do is to confuse people I think that's a great point. Um, we work a lot with challenger brands and often mm -hmm. if you're thinking if you if a challenger has to go up a steeper hill. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a great quote that says markets are like mountains and people have a natural gravitational pull to the market leader. So if you're a challenger and you're trying to get people to break their routine and consider you and stop buying who they were buying and consider you, you can't do that with your mission. So what we find is actually the, you know, when, when we are talking about brand for smaller companies, what we're actually talking about is a very tightly defined uh, and compelling proposition. Mm -hmm. If you think about challenger brands like Avis, you know, one of the most famous advertising campaigns of all time, Avis was the challenger. They were number two. They were going up against budget. Budget car rental had far more. Oops, sorry. My phone. Just yeah, no budget car. Bar budget car rental had uh, larger fleet sizes, more locations. Avis's brand was this idea that we try harder, right? So it was a service play. We're going to treat you better. The lines are going to be shorter. So what we do find is when we do work with challenger brands, when we're talking about brand, we're not talking about how you want to save the world. We're talking mm -hmm. about how can you articulate the unique value that only you can that you, only you can deliver. Yeah. And, and part of that challenge, uh, you know, and part of that challenge is today is, is how do you, um, is how do you communicate that? As you said, you know, when you have, when you have all these other people in, 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 and, you know, major brands, but the other part too, is that we live in a society too now, particularly because of SaaS and everything be easily available, lots of services and products easily available online is we don't have loyalty to begin with. We can switch in a heartbeat. And I think part of the problem is sometimes when you, when you do select a brand, you do select a product or service, you never, you never get anything from them in terms of any connection, right? I mean, you can buy online, you can be subscribed to them, and there's nothing that ever really connects you. So then when a shiny new toy or a new version or a different one comes up and maybe you're only saving a dollar, you go, well, I'll switch over here. Or one feature more, I'll switch over here. And so it's that switching, I think, is a huge challenge too. 100%. There's also a lot of... Uh... There's a lot of re a, a lot of good marketing evidence from the IPA, the Institute of Advertising Practitioners, based out of London, and there's a famous uh, study called "The Long and Short of It" by Les Bennett and Peter Fields, and they actually have shown that customers acquired through discounts and promotions tend to be less sticky, and mm -hmm. so they tend to churn more. So again, you know, how you acquire your customers 
Um, did you get them in just because with a free trial or did you build a relationship up front? Really is a strong determinant of loyalty. I, I think for a lot of small brands, loyalty should not be the main um, focus of their marketing. It's more about penetration and acquisition. Mm -hmm. But 100%, I think it, you know, it's, it's a very hard thing to, 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 to focus on and get good especially in kind of SaaS industries where a lot of the products are very similar. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and people don't see the difference because the differences aren't, aren't well articulated. Uh, so in, in, in the realm of, of performance marketing, where do you see, what do you see on the horizon? Where do you see this going? Are there, are there new platforms? Are there new approaches? Are there, are there things that you are seeing that you think, okay, we need to pay attention to this. And, as a follow-on question, here's one. Um, what role is AI going to play? Because everybody is suddenly just charging like you know, like crazy over to AI tools to do everything for them. So how many people are going to start trying to use AI to generate their brands? Hmm. Um, so for the first question, I think, what are we seeing? Where is it heading? I think for a lot of companies, there's a, a bit of a collapsing of the funnel, if you will. Mm -hmm. So it's brand marketing that has to sell a bit harder and performance marketing that also has to speak to the brand. Yeah. Um, and we're finding that with a lot of our clients. So in typically when we do a repositioning or a brand strategy, we're not just doing the kind of slogan or the big shout on the top. We're drilling that down into the sub messages, into the actual proof points for the sales teams. So I think the first thing is that there's a huge collapsing of the funnel. And I think that's a good thing. Um, to answer your second question about AI, um, I find a lot of these kind of new, I'm, I'm a bit of a skeptic and I find yeah. a lot of these uh, technologies are overblown. I do think AI is going to be a wonderful thing and uh, for humanity. There's a great, um, there's a great book called um, the age of the printing press. And it talked about how um, in the days before Gutenberg, uh, before um, yep. um, you could make books really easily and at a high volume, people would naturally um, invest a lot of time because it was all done by hand. So you'd make really, really big books, you'd gild them, you'd, you'd do a lot of artwork around them. And as a result, the books were very long and only available to the rich. And once Gutenberg created the printing press for the 100 years after, they still made books like that. And so um, it was only 100 years later, actually when Martin Luther came around, did he really unlock the, the real benefit of the printing press, which is you can actually produce far more volume mm -hmm. and you can shrink the size of the communication. So the refer you know, when he was going back and forth to the Catholic church, it was almost like a rap battle. So every yeah. week he said, these are the 10 things I don't like about the Catholic church. The Catholic church came back with here are my 10 things. So I think with AI, we have no idea what its true potential is. But I think in the immediate term, you know, what does that mean for marketing? I think it's, to be honest, it's great for people like me, because I think if anything, it takes away the low value junk yeah. that is being created in terms of content. And uh, from my perspective, we, we, we really work on strategy, we work on differentiation. And I think it, um, it, 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 it creates a space where real creativity and real strategic thinking can thrive. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. That's exactly our, our our thinking too. Is that it actually will take away a lot of the, when used well, take away a lot of the mundane road stuff and get back to allowing us to focus on on the high value things. Interesting, by the way, just you mentioned the Gutenberg Press many years ago when I was running a different company. I was at uh, Sharp, um, the a printing company, well, the multifunction printers, whatever. And the CEO told me that that was the first year since the invention of the Gutenberg press when less paper was produced than the previous year. That's when it had started to cross over to digital wow. and all that. So, um, so there is an actual year where we suddenly went from producing every year, produce more and more and more printed paper that year, produce less. And obviously it's been less and less ever since. So it's interesting when these mm -hmm. things pivot. Yeah, and I wonder how many years after the introduction of the first printer that happened. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah that'd be yeah. interesting to know. Well, listen, uh, Faisal, this has been fantastic. All of Faisal's inf information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your company. 
Sure. So uh, we're called Creative Business Company. We are we call ourselves a performance brand agency. And what we do is we try. We are on a mission to make brand marketing more accountable and effective, and more affordable. And so you can reach us at creativebusinesscompany.com. Uh, we invest in a lot of thought leadership and white papers. You might see them floating around. And if you are looking for someone who can take the fluff out of brand marketing, turn our way. Yeah, and I'd encourage you to go check it out. Taking the fluff out of brand marketing is always a good thing. And you're correct. There's lots of people invest a ton of money in brand marketing. But if you say to them, can you show me, show me the ROI on it? They're like, well, you know, it's kind of hard because it's all this, you know, and then before you know it, they've just said, oh, it's too difficult. But believe me, it's working. <laughs> exactly. We we do not use phantom metrics like uh, yeah. impressions. We we do hard dollars. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, listen. Thanks again, Faisal. Thank you for watching and listening. And I will see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm.